I'm here with Dr. Tess Laurie. Tess, you're a world-class scientist, a research doctor. Your peer-reviewed studies have been cited in over 5,000 times. So it's such an honor and a pleasure to have you. Oh, thanks very much for inviting me, Lawrence. Tess, can we start with a little bit about your background, just for people that don't know you, because you are so accomplished and you do have a very interesting story. So I'd love to kind of start with that, if that's okay. Yeah, well, I grew up in South Africa. I, I studied, I, I, I went to medical school when I was 17. I got my medical degree and I was very much into interested in in obstetrics and pregnancy and childbirth. That was where I wanted to specialize because I loved the fact that with pregnancy, you're not dealing with sick people, you're dealing with healthy people going through a normal process. It's not a medical process. And uh, and then, of course, uh, you know, the, the wonder of having of birth, you know, and babies. But um, my plans were were sort of upended because when I was training as a as an obstet- obstetrician, I fell pregnant, and my baby was born a few weeks early, and got meningitis, and he died. And um, and so I kind of had to rethink everything. Um, I was, uh, uh, you know, obviously very distraught but felt quite responsible for, you know, for not being able to save my own baby and, um, and obviously being in a role where I was helping so many other people have healthy babies. So, uh, and, and I was in a, in a very sort of masculine system in a way, you know, because, um, as a registrar, there were only four women I, I was working with everyone else, everyone else on the circuit were men. And so it had a particular, framework that had to be adhered to and it didn't really accommodate pregnancy so um so when I fell pregnant I was told well you have six weeks of maternity leave and then you need to be back because otherwise you know it won't be fair to other to the other people on the the other doctors on the circuit you know and so so I sort of blamed myself really for not having done what was best for my baby which obviously would have been to take time time off before before giving birth and and so on so um, I ended up going into uh, taking a research position and uh, and I signed up to do a PhD and became an academic for a few years um, whilst, although I was, uh, I, I was um, working in a hospital uh, and conducting the research related to my PhD. But also I, I sort of had to change my focus as well because suddenly I had what, have, what it, the death of my son had highlighted to me was that actually having a child wasn't a simple thing. It wasn't just um, you could do whatever you liked and then, you know, produce a child and your, your baby fits in with your lifestyle. And, you know, uh, it became something very precious and fragile and actually not that easy to accomplish. And so you, you have to be present and pay attention. And uh, and so having a family became my focus for a few years, and I, I and I had I have three children now, very um, well, and uh, and so um, during that time, I then I, I did freelance research. I became a sort of academic for hire, in that, I, and I only worked for nonprofit organisations and. Um, I did a lot of Cochrane reviews in particular. So I became a systematic reviewer and that and sort of an expert on evidence synthesis. And then in uh, 2009, I emigrated with my family to the U- United Kingdom. And uh, and that was following actually that was following a rather traumatic family event uh, incident because we were we we had a burglary in our home, a quite a violent burglary. And um so uh, you asked for the backstory. So I think no, all of these great. things are relevant this, this, to my... No, exactly. No, this is really, really great. I, I think they're all relevant to my perspective in many ways because... So we had this burglary. It was, it was kind of, you know, it, the, the aftermath of the burglary. It was a very violent burglary. It was, you know, was akin to the worst horror movie you've ever seen uh, visually. You know, there was blood everywhere and it was um, very, very um, uh, traumatic and... And our children obviously were, they were not obviously, but they were in the house and it was very traumatic for them. So again, you know, there was a sense of, of needing to protect the family and, uh, and uh, get them to a safe place. But what that illustrated to me, the this, this sort of what I was left with after, reflect, after reflection was really an empathy for those men who had felt, uh, you know, who, who had been able to, um, to, a burgle and assault, and and uh, and really, um, what had what had driven them to do so? The the inequity of a system, 
that mm. actually divides people and puts them against each other and, and encourages people to justify behavior against one another, you know, that's anti-human. So, you know, it, it really brought home to me what a dysfunctional system we're in. And I think that that's the overarching sense I've had my entire life, that the system we're in is totally dysfunctional and it needs to change. Mm. But it was only really when COVID came along that the means for change seemed possible. So, you know, unlike many people, um, I see that there is benefit from what has come out for the last three years, or, you know, despite the fact that there's, there's many horrors, I mm-hmm. see that we now actually have the opportunity for the great change that's been needed for, for a very, very long time. So just to finish my story, so, so I, you know, I came to the UK, I set up a company called the Evidence-Based Medicine Consultancy Limited. It was a, a, a small limited company. We did evidence synthesis and helped the World Health Organization from an external consultant point of view to develop clinical practice guidelines, uh, specifically in relation to the reproductive health care. Although um, the the type of skills that one has as a guideline developer or um, systematic reviewer, it's a methodological skill, so it can be applied across a range of different topics. And in actual fact, uh, a, a suite of reviews that I completed in 2021 with other authors was on the management of brain tumors. And that was a sort of a three-year project for the Cochrane group in the UK. So yeah, so that's, that was what I was doing until COVID came along. And then when COVID came along, it was quite clear to me that there was not sufficient evidence, A, to call a pandemic, B, for the interventions that were being recommended by the WHO and our governments. And so I felt I needed to get involved, but I wasn't quite sure how in the beginning uh, until I saw you know, useful old medicines being being uh, discredited and uh, the doctors using them also discredited. And so that's how I got involved, specifically around the story of ivermectin. Well, Tess, why I was so looking forward to talking to you is because, you know, you seem like a just a very nice person. You don't seem very competitive. You're incredibly academic. And I'm sure that the aspect of standing against the crowd is very difficult. And I remember when um, COVID shut the world down very, very early on because I was in the US and I know Italy was one of the first dealing with the the, the hard hit. And I I don't know how I got hold of this article, but it was written by someone like you, incredibly intelligent, had all these citations. And I remember it was long. It it, it took me over an hour to read. And I remember when I finished it, the two things that I I remembered was, I think the average death was over 80 and had to over two comorbidities. And I remember calling my best friend, who's who's a very smart guy, Brad, and I and I said, like, this is so crazy. They're shutting down the world and it's not what they're saying it is. And he said, Lawrence, he's like, you know, people's elderly relatives are dying. You don't want to, you don't want to be the guy who's who's talking out against this. And he's like, you know, it's gonna be bad for your work. People are gonna, you know, people are gonna blame you. It was such a contentious time and motions are running so high. He just said, you know, he he gave me that advice. And he obviously I, I love him. He's he's one of my best friends and he was looking out for me. But I remember thinking, yeah, this is probably not my fight, you know, just put my head down. But I remember me being frustrated. So I can only imagine you where this is your field and you know, you know a lot more than I'm sure a lot of people that were given these big voices that everyone listened to. Um, and it, it was really a crazy time. And sorry, this is a little random, but mm-hmm. my great grandfather is a Holocaust victim. So my grandfather moved from Germany to England just before, I think he was about 16 or 17. And he, he basically started from nothing and he had a really, really tough upbringing. And my father grew up in a very difficult household without much money and he worked really hard and he gave me um, a, a very loving upbringing and middle-class family that I'm so grateful for. But um, I was always so fascinated in that era of history because just before the rise of Nazism, Germany was, you know, had so many Nobel laureates and it was, it was an incredible country, you know, had to have so many positives. And there's, it's such an interesting study of history. How did this monster rise to power? You know, how did the people get behind him? And a lot of people get upset when you make that comparison, but it's not saying that the people the people in power pushing policies are like the Nazis, they're not. But it's just so interesting to see how in the fog of war that COVID was, 
a few voices, just everyone listens. But humans tend to be incredibly obedient, even if the evidence is is pointed to the contrary. And that, that's why I'm I'm just so grateful there were people like you that were that were standing up against the madness. But will you can you can we I don't want to spend too long, but can we can you take me back to how you were feeling when you when you when you knew that that you had more knowledge than these people putting in these policies that ended up being very detrimental. Were you incredibly frustrated? Were you angry? Were you were you just systematic? You know, how, how were you feeling and what was it like, I guess? Well, I think I was angry, but I could see, I sensed there was something else going on that I didn't quite understand because it didn't make sense. And, you know, the more I, I, I researched it and I, and, I, and I listened to, you know, different um, opinions, I, I got a sense that there was, um, that, you know, that, that there was some big corruption going down. And, and I think, you know, there is that why. It took me quite a long time to figure out what the why was because, you know, we, it's, you can't believe that everybody's corrupt and, you know, uh, but you referenced um, Nazi Germany and, um, you know, we've been groomed. We live in a world where we're groomed to be order followers and where and where and where money um where money dominates so everything is everything revolves around money and we're all in such debt you know so we have ways of being controlled and manipulated you know and then and then if one goes and then in terms of the grooming you know i think this has happened over a very long time through television programming and so on i mean it's called programming for a reason i believe so you know people are programmed how to behave towards each other what makes a good citizen uh and so on and all of these things were played upon the manipulation was massive uh at the you know during covid you know and and i can say i th- probably part of the reason I woke up is because I actually haven't watched television for the last five years, you know, so, but I think, you know, a lot of people are very quick to blame people for not waking up or for going along and for following orders or whatever, but people really did think they were doing the best for others. You know, that's what they were sold. Um, you know, you're doing this to help other people and, and uh, you must put others first before yourself and, and all of that. So there was a high level, um, they called a PSYOP, don't they? A high level PSYOP. Uh, on on the population and those people, what I see when I go around and do this community outreach and speaking, most of the people who, um, there are many people who've been kind of marginalized by the system for a long time and they're the ones who are awake and aware and uh, and not only that, but also a lot of women because I think women are really are more tuned into their intuition and they, you know, they uh, are tuned into protecting children um, protecting their children. And um, uh, so unfortunately, women's voices have been really, um, uh, you know, subjugated for a very long time and not not heard. Women haven't had a platform and haven't felt like they could speak out. So women have been holding a lot of worry in themselves uh, and meeting, you know, they meet in the stand in the parks here in the UK, you know, gather in, in parks and so on to share things, but they just haven't had the, the, um, or felt like they have the the platform, the power, the voice to make a difference, and 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 so I'm fortunate well, to be able to do so. Because I don't know if you have the you had the same feeling, but I I definitely I think it was just it was happening before 2020, like maybe a few years before, but that it was really highlighted where it was just so difficult to find out what's real and what's not. You know that the, the I I know Trump was. Was the ones who started talking about fake news, and then you had these legitimate publications that were were just writing basically opinion pieces as if it's fact. And it seemed like um, I love that phrase, "the fog of war," because there was so much that you can only imagine in a, in, in a war like um, what's going on in Ukraine right now. That finding out the truth, there's, there's there's two different there's two different stories. And normally, the I, I have an undergraduate degree in history. It's normally the victor that writes the history. So it's just very very difficult to find out what is true and what's not. And I feel like that's that was one of the the biggest things that I was struggling with was who are the people of authority that I should listen to. So I had a really good friend who's like Lawrence, you know, Dr. Fauci has been doing this for you know 30, 40 years, like. You should listen to him. Why are you listening to these crazy people that are conspiracies? Other people were like, well, look at, you know, his his track record. It's not very pretty. And then you'd get these people like you who have all these peer-reviewed citations 
and then they might speak out against it. And then other people will say, no, no, no. And they're trying to discredit them. And it was this, I feel like that's only almost accelerated now. I'm very nervous 2024 is going to be another election year in the US. And I'm very nervous it's going to get really bad again, very polarized. Have you struggled with finding, like, I guess, with your background, you mentioned Ivan Macton. You, when you're an expert in something, I guess it makes it a bit easier. But have you struggled with finding out what's real news and what's fake news, like with, with what's happening or, or not really? Yes, uh, it is. And, and the way that I deal with it is to focus on the, imagining the world we want to create and not get distracted and sidetracked by all the by trying to prove whatever it is was real and what you know happened in the last few years i feel that all of that will be revealed in time but what's really needed now is an is an alternative better ways this, this these old systems are coming down they're falling down as we speak they're crashing down around our ears and what we need is are the new systems that are going to replace the old we've seen as the pendulum swing uh, this this embracing of science, you know, has made science, uh, it's like a religion. And so you believe the science. And so you can have individuals like Tony Fauci saying, I am the science. And you can have the UN uh, representative uh, saying, uh, we are the science, you know, and everybody should know that. Um, and uh, And it is like a religion. And if I can just say that science is extremely limited Science is, um, you know, and the way that we've we've gone uh, down the 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 root of science with this absolute reason, rules and regulations and whatever, and and assuming that everything that happens is because of science, um, it actually is an extremely narrow view on the world. Most of the things that happen in the world cannot be explained through science. Uh, and so we have a very reductionist model that tries to explain everything through the limited knowledge, uh, the limited uh, view, the, the, the limited science that we have. And so we just get ourselves um, really in, in this very, uh, a very limited uh, world. And, uh, you know, if you think about um, even Einstein, he came up with a theory of, you know, relativity and all of that. But the biggest contribution he made was that the the, the greatest power, you know, the, 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 the most powerful force in the universe is love. Now, love cannot be quantified and it cannot be measured and it can, you know, so, um, so, and that probably sounds all a bit sort of, you know, uncomfortable um, to most people. Um, so, uh, but that is someone who we call a genius. Um, you know, there's somebody, there's people like Carl Jung who speak about synchronicity. And Carl Jung said, you know, he he said, um, you know, uh, we, we talk about coincidence. Uh, well, you know, uh, in actual fact, uh, and then he, he coined the term synchronicity as a series of coincidences that happen to make things happen. Most things happen by coincidence, and this is something that uh, we need to uh, get back to and explore, uh, because if you know nature, for example, is extremely um, is is very ordered, but in actual fact, every everything that happens in nature is by coincidence. It depends on this and that and the other and what happens at at the moment. And as human beings, we're part of nature. We're the same, you know. You know, I can. You know, wherever you are, it depends on on so many variables, and what happens, and depends on a, a whole pile of other things. You know, people coming in and meeting, or weather, whatever. So, um, the majority of things. So, so when we look at when, if we want to define order, order in in the natural world is synchronicity, is organic, and chaos, which is where we find ourselves now, is brought about by rules and regulations. Most, for, uh, and just, just with, with regard to science, you know, if you want to create, do an experiment, you have to make rules. You have to say, so just say you want to see whether a drug works. Well, you have to say, well, we're going to look at it in adults. We're going to look at it in healthy adults. And we're going to, you know, we're going to, or whatever, uh, the age, this age, that age. And, you know, if you just take it back to the COVID vaccines, vaccines, they were not even tested on pregnant women or vulnerable people uh, or people who with, with uh, multiple, um, chronic conditions or, or whatever, they weren't tested among those people. And yet those people were the first pe first to be lined up to receive these experimental injections. So, so rules and regulations create chaos is what I'm saying because it's arbitrary man-made stuff, whereas all the stuff we don't understand, the whole lot of it 
is all the stuff that is uncertain uh, is uh, that's that's nature and natural is is coincidence and synchronicity, and so we need to get back to that. And I believe that's where wisdom comes in. And we, you know, we need signs and wisdom. And the wisdom side of things has been completely ignored. You know, old wives' tales get called old wives' tales and totally um, undermined by science. Um, you know, there's been uh, there's been this this um, this push towards isn't isn't the modern wonderful. And all the, the wisdom of the past has been chucked out. And just to leave you with, with uh, just the last thing I have to say is just thinking about um, Paracelsus, who was a, a physician and a doctor of toxicology in the, in the 1500s. You know, and he said that, um, that uh, you know, that being a good doctor is a combination of observation and received wisdom. Mm. And so it's, it's, it's a kind of a knowing that we comes from somewhere we don't know where. It's that knowing it's received wisdom plus the observation of science and you know and the experience. So uh, we've really got to get back. We've got to stop this very narrow focus on the science. And I'm saying that as a scientist, and I've been very focused on the science for most of my life. And now I see it cannot operate in isolation. This is what we have in this current situation is science gone completely bad. It's It cannot be relied upon. It's too easily manipulated and, and um, corrupted. It's just numbers. It doesn't give you the full picture. And we need to, we need to go back to um, encourage people in this, in this time of what is real and what is not into really having some quiet time and listening to their hearts and feeling it out and saying, I don't know if this is right for somebody else, but this feels right for me and this is what I'm going to do. Well, Tess, I'm so glad you said the science plus wisdom. And you're the authority to say that because you are a scientist, but it definitely feels like there's a lack of wisdom in the West right now. Ivermectin is one of those things that I couldn't tell you much about. And I've listened to podcasts that talk about it. Seeing as you're such an authority, I'd love to just spend a few minutes, if you don't mind. Um, the, the only thing that I know about was it, it's very cheap to produce and it's used in among millions of people. Um, and I think it was for a lot in places like the Amazon with um, uh, like bugs. <laughs> yeah, but that, that, that's, there you go. I'm showing you my limited knowledge, but I'd love to, um, if you could talk a little bit about that, because I know that was kind of your segue into being such an authority on something, then you can tell that the, the things that the other authority figures are saying are not that accurate. Yeah, I have mentioned it's such a wonderful story. And I wish I, you know, that, that's that's a, a lengthy story on its own. But just uh, briefly, you know, it, Ivermectin was discovered in the in the late 70s, early 80s on a golf course in Japan by a uh, a uh, doctor uh, at the time, he's now Professor Satoshi Amura. He's just turned 88. And uh, he discovered it. It's, it's in a bacteria called Avermectin, um, Streptomyces Avermectinius. And uh, it's a, basically, it's a, it's a fermented product of a bacteria, like many other fairly natural products or naturally derived products. Um, and uh, it was, um, uh, Prof. Satoshi Amura met uh, a guy called, um, uh, John, uh, he was, he's Professor Campbell, William Campbell, and they, um, uh, and Campbell was working with Merck. Merck developed, uh, Ivermectin out of this, um, Avermectin and marketed it, but it was so cheap to, it was, it, he, they could sell it. They couldn't make a huge profit from it because the people suffering from the diseases that Ivermectin uh, was shown to work for with parasitic diseases, like worms and scabies and all of that. Well, they couldn't really afford the uh, uh, high price. So, in actual fact, at the time in the nineties, um, the Merck um, CEO said, "We're going to gift it to Africa. We're going to gift this this um, this medicine to Africa." And and so they got a lot of kudos from that. So they, you know, it became generic. Anyone could make it. Really cheap to make and was widely used. So. Billions of people have used ivermectin, and it's been on the World Health Organization's database. It was also useful for animals um, because, you know, we at the end of the day, uh, we get worms, animals get worms. Uh, it's a, it's, it was a good dewormer, shall we say. So how is that effective in um, helping with COVID? Ah, so well, also what I want to say in 2015, 
ivermectin, um, the Prof. Satoshi Amira and Campbell got awarded a Nobel Prize for ivermectin because it was being shown to be so useful and, and so safe as well. Uh, what I wanted to say on the on the Fiji Access database, there were um, you know, they were recording side effects to to all sorts of drugs, and uh, with ivermectin, it, there were incredibly few side effects. So it was shown to be a very very safe drug, even at ten times the normal dose, and so on. So when COVID came along, it was widely used in Africa and India and South America. Um, and uh, the, the doctors, they thought, well, let's try ivermectin. You know, we have it. It's in our tool, toolbox, um, as one would do. You know, let's see what works. And so we got, there were reports and studies coming out from doctors in those areas to say ivermectin works. And, uh, you know, these are our study findings and so on. So then Pierre Corey, uh, Dr. Corey in the USA, um, he went to, he, he's a, a pulmonologist, ICU specialist, and uh, I saw a video of him in the December 2020 saying, you know, really in front of the state Senate, asking that ivermectin uh, be allowed to be used and, and, and be promoted as a treatment for COVID, for, um, treatment and prevention. And uh, the, polit uh, uh, but anyway, it struck me as really strange and he'd done, that he, he was having to ask politicians to use a safe old medicine. Uh, and so my curiosity was piqued and, and, uh, and he'd written a paper. So I got his paper and I thought, this is a, it's a good paper, but it, it didn't have a meta-analysis. So I thought, well, this is something I can do. This is my area of work. And so, um, so long story short, we put together, I put together a team, uh, and we did a systematic review on ivermectin. It showed that it was kind of a no brainer, really. There was no reason not to use it. It could probably make a big impact. On the on the pandemic, uh, the number of deaths that we, we were seeing, and so we we prepared a document just like I would have done for the WHO. We prepared a document, um, and we sent it to the FDA, the NIH, um, WHO, uh, the UK authorities, Canadian authorities, and so on to say um, ivermectin should be used for both prevention and treatment of COVID, and that was um, February 2021. But then there was uh, there was a, a big um, pushback. I don't know if you saw the. Have you seen that film, uh, Letter to Andrew Hill? No. So uh, the w the WHO actually had a consultant appointed to do a review on ivermectin, and uh, I contacted him. Pierre Corey put me in touch with him, and I contacted him and said, "Let's work together and prepare a robust review." And he said, you know, he said, okay, we'll do that. And then just before we were to get the work together, he published a paper on a preprint server, which means it's not peer reviewed, which said uh, ivermectin reduces deaths by 75%, but the authorities can't look at the evidence uh, and more trials are needed. Now, what this basically meant was that uh, it kicked the, it kicked ivermectin down the road. We were wanting to get ivermectin made available as soon as possible. We felt we, as soon as we get our paper out there uh, and the authorities know, everyone will have access to ivermectin. And uh, what, what his work did was it, um, it said, oh, more trials are needed and, um, and that could take years. And so we had a meeting and during the meeting, I asked him who had put pressure on him and um, when would he be ready to, to share the findings so we could get ivermectin out there and he said oh six weeks and so on and but it was clear in the interview that he was under some kind of pressure and and uh, I asked well clear to me and I asked him uh you know who whether his sponsors had had uh, an influence on his conclusions and he said yes so uh, so that revealed to me a level of corruption that I'd never seen before or had the evidence of and it made me realize that there were forces at play that that were, um, you know, and, and COVID being a billion dollar industry, I immediately thought, well, this is because they, you know, they want these vaccines to be out there. There's such a lot of money to be made. And if there is a safe old treatment that's cheap, then, and there's no pandemic and, you know, and everybody can just treat themselves at home because you could literally just post off this ivermectin to everyone in the country and they could keep it in their cupboard, you know, for right. very little, you know, uh, then, then, then there's no money to be made. And so my first my first thought was that this is because uh, of uh, you know because of money it's a profit driven thing, but subsequently 
we've become aware that it's not just money. It's it's about uh, control oh. and power. And there is this push to centralize and monopolize health policy through the WHO. And um, and the the WHO is is only in control of a quarter of its budget. So whoever contributes the rest basically determines what um, you know determines health policy around the world. I think it's so sad, Tess, because I remember when I moved to the US, it was about twenty one years ago, and I remember it was right when the Bush Junior was was trying to get justification to invade Iraq. And they were just weren't finding the justifications and they were pushing it. And I felt like I, I was young. I, I wasn't really, I was working a lot. I wasn't really following any of the news very much. But you just got the impression that, of course, it's the big military companies are pushing for war because they're going to profit so much. They don't really have the evidence. He wants to finish his dad's war. And they went in, they made all that money. And it ended up being you know, a huge you know, failure. It didn't seem to achieve anything in 20 years. And then now, in, so that was the kind of the, the military pushing it. And now we, I feel like, if it's so hard not to see the truth and it seems so obvious like you said it's not just the money but it's the power too and it's the revolving door between people that work in government people that um sit on these boards of, of um that make these decisions it's just so so obvious and there's so much evidence now we see it all um can i ask you a random thought that's how many people do you think see the truth and see how all the corruption so just say say with them the fact that these big companies made billions of dollars with no downside, and they were, it, you know, the, the government policies forced a vaccine that made these companies all this money. It's just it, it, the corruption. Even if they started with um, the right intentions, this it, it's just it, the, the system seems so rigged. But do you think the majority of people see that, or do you think it's still just you know a small minority, like a twenty percent? Um, because I just wonder. You mentioned earlier about um, we were talking about trying to decide what's real and what's not. And I just look at the average person that I know, or even take myself, you know, I have a, I, I work quite a lot. I have hobbies. I have friends that I try and see sometimes that I don't get much time to I have a two and a half year old. I try and make time to see my wife and have date night every night again. You're so busy. You have so much going on. It really does take an effort to listen to podcasts and listen to people like you who are authority figures and realize just, um, you know, how corrupt the system we live in is that so many people, I just feel like they have so much going on that they're just kind of going through life with blinders. And I wonder if they even realize these things because all the things you're telling me, I've heard similar things from other people and, and I know it's true, but I just wonder how many people are just living with blinders on. I think the Western countries, so this varies according to country and population, but the Western countries ironically, are the most enslaved to the system. Mm. They are the most uh, enslaved. So people who live in Asia, uh, they're used to corrupt governments. They, it's been, always mm. been, it's been pretty out there for a long time. Dictators have come and gone, same in Africa. You know, people don't trust their governments. Uh, it's in countries where they trust their governments, they believe the governments are doing the best for them and, and you know, always have. Um, they And they profit from, from things. Uh, I don't know how many people you know, but... Uh, who have shares and fires, et cetera, but many people do. So you're in that yes. money-making system. Uh, you've got your children in the best school, so you think, and uh, you've all got the latest gadgets. Well, these are the things that enslave us and uh, and put the blinkers on. And so that's why it's the Western countries that have been uh, most, uh, most, they're the most vaccinated, they're they're again, you know, will be suffering and bearing the brunt, really. I think of of what's to come. That's so interesting. Um, but how many? I would say, you know, in the UK, and also then there's degrees because not everybody's wide awake, but there are many people who now know, um, feel that the vaccines are harmful. They've had so many people in their families get sick, cancer. Um, heart disease, young people, um, you know, having really bad changes and, of course, um, death and sudden death. So many people are suspecting that, but they might not see the big picture. They might not realize it. They, they still might just think this is incompetence uh, and, uh, and and not realize that actually there's, you know, there's this power grab going down with this one world government trying to, to um, manifest itself out of the uh, the uh, supranational structures. Let's, can we talk a little bit about vaccines? Because I, I'll use my, say, myself as a case study. I grew up 
just assuming that you know that the incredible story of the of the vaccines that stopped things like you know it, there's certain things in England that have been eradicated by vaccines that you don't have anymore. It, I think is is rabies one of them? I know, I know you know there's there's been so many lives saved by vaccines. So you just have that in your mindset like vaccines are good and you don't really see the subtleties. And then I just recently saw something and it, it was talking about the CDC schedule and the link between um, the rising autism rates. So it said in 1983, the CDC schedule had 10 vaccines and autism was one in 10,000. By 2013, it was up to 32 vaccines and it was the autism rose to one in 88. And then by 2018, it was 74 vaccines and the, it, the autism has risen, risen to one in 36. I mean, these are such crazy statistics. And then I haven't read the real Nancy Fauci by JFK Jr. because I've heard enough people that I trust talk about it that I know the horrors and I know it's going to depress me. And I know JFK talked about it himself. He said it's a very tough book to read. He won't let his wife read it. But it was just talking about how, you know, what things like when they do the experimental vaccines, they they were doing it on foster kids in New York, how many died. I mean, just awful, this almost psychopaths running these um these experiments. And there's, there's, there's no safety trials on so many of these vaccines. And then when you look at the right now, it's probably higher than 74. But if you took those 74 vaccines that are on the, um, on the list, so many of them are given to children. There was one, I forget which one it was, which is, it was, um, the story was, it was made for, um, I think for, for gay men and very, promiscuous prostitutes or something. And it was like for, for some kind of STD. And then they realized that there wasn't really a market for that. So then they they got it into the um, the drugs that you give children. Obviously, they're not exposed to, you know, anything sexual when they're, you know, little babies, but they're giving them the vaccine and that's having all these negative effects. So the more the more research that I've done, the more I've heard about it, it's um, number one, it's incredibly sad. And secondly, it's so confusing because I have a two and a half year old. He's already had a whole bunch of vaccines and I'm sure some of them were wonderful, but I'm sure some of them probably weren't. My wife and I took um, both of the COVID vaccines when they first came out and I knew I didn't need it. And the only reason was I wanted to see my family in England and I wanted to travel and I hadn't traveled for a year. So I feel very bitter that I was kind of forced into taking something. She, we're trying for a second child. She's not getting pregnant. Who knows if that's an effect? I don't know. But this, so, so it's, this is so personal to me. And I know if it's personal to me, I've got other friends who are, um, they're, they're very nervous now. They're starting families. Like, what do I do with my child? Because when you go, like I'm in Chicago, I was in Chicago, you go to Northwestern Hospital, one of the best hospitals in the world. They don't give you a choice. You can't say, well, I'll take these 10 vaccines, but not these other 60. They say, you know, I remember when I first, brought my son there, I was asking them something. And the lady basically just shot me down. She said, if you're in the system, shut up. And this is this is the system. That's it. Um, and I was like, well, I guess they know best. Now I'm a little bit more nervous. And I just feel like it's so unclear. So I'd love to talk a little bit about vaccines and um, your thoughts on it and maybe some advice for you know people like me, young parents that, um, that are trying to make these decisions. Because this, I'm really glad we started this off with you talking about your background, and I'm so sorry about you losing your first son, but how important your three kids are and family's everything. And I've got that same thing where there's nothing I wouldn't do for my son. And I would feel so bad if he got something because I didn't do my due diligence as a parent and, and you know, and I, I risked his life. So I'd love to talk a little bit about that if, if we could. Mm -hmm. Yes, we have been persuaded to outsource our health decision making to politicians and protocols and, and that's really what's happened and and they are informed by big pharma so we really need to take back decision making and choices for our children especially and if in doubt if there's any uncertainty listen to your heart what i'm hearing from you is you're un uncertain so then it's safer to wait if there's a remote chance that you're not sure whether those vaccines are safe for your child just wait because childhood, you know, we, um, measles and, uh, and mumps and rubella and all of these, uh, childhood diseases are not deadly, 
they are, and they're very rare these days. But we used to, when I was a kid, if you got measles, you would go and you'd go and have a house party with your with other families and mums because you wanted the kids to all get measles because it's a very innocuous disease. And once you've got it, you've got immunity for life. Mm-hmm. We are natural beings. We're part of nature. We've we've been disconnected. We've been we've been thought, you know, modern sophistication means that we can detach ourselves from everything and we can be embedded in in uh, this very modern slick aesthetic if you if you like you know mm-hmm. uncluttered existence but in actual fact we are natural we are from nature we're part of nature and we're equipped with immune systems and now you know we're actually we should be able to heal ourselves just like other animals and the way uh you know uh, everything um thrives given the right nutrients and uh, an environment uh, to grow. So we should be spending more time looking at our, our nutrition and making sure that we're giving our children the right food and water and sunshine and, you know, stimulation and joy and love and all of that to, to help them grow, not injections from Big Pharma. But if I could just, just in case, I don't want your audience to think that I'm anti-vax because this is a quick label you label on somebody if you feel their view is uncomfortable about vaccines. Mm. I vaccinated all my children with all their childhood vaccination, with the whole thing. Uh, Would I do that now? The answer is no. Because now I know what COVID has shown me is that the that big pharma it really has opened my eyes. Big pharma has uh, cannot be trusted. Uh, it's it's a money. It's a profit driven industry, and corporations need customers. So they need so if they can make people sick, uh, then they then they can provide the drugs. So their customers are sick people, not healthy people, and it's not in their interest to make products that heal and cure. It's in their interest to keep people sick and make them sick. And um, and so, you know, as, as cold and calculating as it is, that's what corporations are. Corporations, actually, if you look at the word corporation, it's dead speak. It's it's a dead entity and it has no morals. It's not a human being that, you know, will do its best for you. So, um, so and then just, so, so as I say, so what I've learned from COVID is that A, big pharma can't be trusted. Um, B, that the vaccine trials have never been properly done. They've never been properly saline placeboed, um, placebo controlled trials. They've they've compared one vaccine with another vaccine. You know, just imagine. Uh, so, with a placebo controlled trial, what you do is you want to compare, uh, say, one drug with no drug. You want to see, and then you're going to look for for an outcome. So, what the what these trials do is they compare, uh, for example, just say you wanted to look at, um, you wanted to see whether Coca-Cola was linked to obesity in childhood or something. So instead of comparing Coca-Cola with fresh water, and a liter of Coca-Cola with a liter of fresh water a day, they're comparing a liter of Coca-Cola with a liter of Fanta a day. So you can see that that, that by doing that, you're not going to discover whether or not that one causes obesity or not. Uh, and that's kind of what they've done with the vaccines. They haven't actually compared them to nothing. And what's more, they haven't compared them with the, with the disease. So they haven't then, for example, with the COVID vaccines, looked to see um, what the impact is in the in the in the real world. They've looked at whether it causes whether it uh, leads to an immune response. So they've looked in the blood rather than to look at the 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 subsequent disease. So the trials have have not been well done in um, you know in brief. And then the other thing with the childhood vaccines is that even if the trials had been well done, they didn't do trials where they looked at giving four, three or four vaccines at the same time. So a lot of these, when you take your child for vaccination, they get two or three vaccines or four even at the same time. And so that's a massive assault on a baby system. You know, this this little small little soft thing that any ways a few kilos getting this massive uh you know um load of toxins basically uh that its little immune system has to fight and not only the toxins but whatever's in the vials that keep it um sterile that keep whatever mm-hmm. you know there's there's all sorts of things that go into that that liquid um and so um and that becomes cumulative. So there were no studies done that showed giving four compared with nothing is is safe. 
So we just don't have safety data on these things. And then lastly, you know, if I could just say from a common sense and a mother's point of view, um, you know, I remember taking my my babies uh, for their vaccines and, you know, they would often have fever after uh, in the night after getting the vaccine. And I would obviously tell myself that I was doing my best and that's normal. And even when I was a doctor and we were, I was uh, recommending vaccines for certain things um, to women, you know, I would say your child might have a bit of a fever, but don't worry, that's normal. It's not normal to make anyone sick from anything, especially healthy people. So it's not normal and we must uh, remove that that uh, skewed perspective. That is something that's crept in. It's part of the propaganda. It is not normal to make anyone feverish or sick when, when taking a, 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 a something that's supposed to be preventative to prevent disease. Um, and and also, you know, if one just thinks one 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 tries so hard to protect one's children from pain. Uh, you know, we don't want them if they stand on a thorn or get stung by a bee or whatever, you know, we're, we're, we're there. So it's totally unnatural and counterintuitive to sit there and, and have someone stick needles into your baby. And these days it's in the UK, it's 10 by the age of one. So by the age of one year old, you know, um, and even us as adults, I don't like needles. Do you like needles? I mean, we, we, you know, we man up and we take them if we have to, but, um, it's not normal. And a lot of children, you know, at least 50% of children have a fear of needles. So why do we expose our children to that fear? What does that teach a child just from a psychological point of view that your parent can stand by and, and make you get hurt? And so I can say, you know, when I was uh, having my children vaccinated, you know, there was a, I had to suspend my intuition. You know, I had to suspend my heart and say, I'm doing the best I can. But it's really now more than ever Given all we know and all we've learned during COVID, we actually really need to engage that intuition. We actually need to trust it and say, you know, and say, I'm going to do what I feel is best. Well, um, I'm so glad you said that about intuition because I, that's something I'm, I'm 44 and it's only in the last maybe year or two that I'm really trying to trust, trust that feeling, the gut feeling, because I'm getting that. I've been a huge reader for the last at least 20 years. I've probably read on average a book a week. So, you know, that's several thousand books. And it, there's a lot of knowledge there that's in my gut. So if, if I hear something or, or I, or I read something that just seems so off from all the other things that I've heard and read and listened to, then I've got to start trusting it. And that's something I'm working on. So I'm so glad you said that. I'm also really glad you said about. The things that are important for health, things like getting outside, getting sunshine. There is a small group of people, like people like Dr. Andrew Huberman. He's very, he's got a big famous podcast in the US. These doctors talking about these things for health. But fundamentally, especially in the US, we are a very sick society. You know, obesity is at all time highs. The, the nutrition in most people's food is just abysmal. Um, and so it doesn't surprise me that, um, that what you're saying, that it, it, it's, it's everything that I'm seeing around me. Um, can, can I ask you what, what you mentioned about um, listening to intuition with your children? And I remember when one of the times my son got vaccinated, it was just like you said, it was, I think, one in his, each thigh and one in each arm. And he was just really in, uncomfortable and crying and screaming. He got sick after. It was just like you said, it was actually very traumatic. And it was so difficult as a parent having that um, those two mindsets where I just instinctually knew that this didn't, see, sorry, I didn't know. It didn't seem like this was, it seemed like they were hurting my my sweet, innocent baby son. But at the same time, all the, like you said, the programming, no, no, vaccines are good. And, um, but can I ask you, so of the, um, if there's in the US, say 75 vaccines in the program, of those 75, are there some that you still think are, are, are essential? Because you mentioned like a lot of these diseases kind of aren't around anymore. Just say, I love to travel the world. Um, I was in your hometown last year, Cape Town. Botswana, I know I do like to travel and I'm going to expose my son to some of these places. Um, are there some, are there certain vaccines that you know of that like, yes, you definitely should get these or, or is it, are, are there cures for most things that they have vaccines for now? I wouldn't take anything. I wouldn't take any oh. vaccines anymore. Um, oh, okay. not until, you know, and if it meant that I'm, I'm unsure, so I'm not going to travel somewhere, mm. I would rather do that, um, yes. than, than take a vaccine. Exposed. I know. So tetanus, uh, tetanus vaccines, these are ones that we've, you know, been taking. If you stand on a rusty nail or you, you yes. have a dog bite or, you know, whatever you, you would take, take a tetanus vaccine. But, um, even that, 
I'm not sure anymore. So I, if I'm not sure, I wouldn't. Uh, what I would do is I would make sure that my immune system was always supported, that I had everything that I needed to treat illnesses that we, we might come across. Um, but in terms of vaccine, and I, and I would certainly explore natural remedies because, you know, we, we used to survive uh, very well uh, a long time ago with, you know, I'm, I'm speaking ancestrally, you know, there's a huge amount of, of natural herbs. And if you think of us as, um, as uh, products of nature, we, we are natural and everything in nature uh, is provided. There's an abundance of, there's, you know, nature's apothecary. There's, I mean, so many uh, natural um, uh, herbs and remedies and supplements and things that we actually don't know of. So we, we really at a point now, it's quite exciting to realize that we, can, we don't need big pharma. We actually, uh, we, we need to explore all these other remedies that have been used for thousands and thousands of years. Many of them, you know, many in Asia uh, are still in use, Africa, South America. They have a whole lot of remedies that we don't, we haven't even heard of or had access to. So those, that's where we need to look. We need to look at indigenous medicine and see how people used to heal. And, and also, not just that, we need to extract ourselves from a system that makes us sick. Mm. And, you know, um, if one looks, if one, I know we, we sort of moved on from vaccines, but, if, 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 you know, it's it's really part of, of taking responsibility for health. So I didn't get a chance really to say that, you know, we've established the World Council for Health, uh, which is, and our main message is really to empower people to take back control of their health. You cannot take health for granted. There are many people profiting, many organizations and individuals, corporations and individuals profiting from your bad health and profiting from making you unhealthy. So, you know, they'll tell you that something's low fat and that's good for you. They'll tell you that um, that this is low sugar or it's only got so many calories or kilojoules and so you can have it. Um, basically, we need to stay away from anything that's processed, mm. all processed food, anything that's got a long shelf life, don't go near it, you know, I mean, in terms of food mm. um, and, uh, and processed foods, you need to to be able to identify your food. Is it a cabbage? Is it a carrot? You know, is it uh, a potato or a piece of steak? Uh, it needs to be the highest quality you can afford. And, uh, and you need to buy it from the farmer or from the, the local grocer uh, and have a relationship with them so you know the provenance of your food because it's, it's, uh, it's, it's really so important that we put the very best into our bodies and not and not um, polluted with with the with the the junk that's for sale in the supermarkets and not be <laughs> not be tempted by all those you know those um, sweet products mm. and and um, unhealthy products. I'm so glad you said that because it's not. There's so many people like I, I'm. I've been a long time in kind of the the health and fitness. I've been around a lot of personal trainers and that kind of industry. And I've always uh, walked out and exercised. And the one thing I've noticed is um, there's so many fads that people talk about um, and, and life hacks and everything. But the most important things for me is is good sleep and nutritious food. And they're, they're not sexy. And, and it's just, it's, it's just that. <laughs> but, but, but that's at the bottom of the, the base of the pyramid for health. Um, and I'm so glad that the, the idea we're talking about corruption with um, things like the pharmaceutical companies and the government, but it's the same with food. I think they had a recent food pyramid and they had, you know, sugary cereal was near the top. And I mean, if you look at the ingredients in the, in, I think, I think, I don't know, I haven't been in, in Europe for 20 years, but I think the supermarkets in the US are worse than Europe, but maybe that's changed too. But just the, there's so little food with nutritional value in a supermarket. It's, it's unbelievable. Mm. Um, and I'm so glad you said things about shelf life. I think they said, if you have a, a McDonald's burger, and you just leave it on for a year, it'll look pretty much exactly the same because it's, it's not food anymore. You know? um, so yeah, I'm so glad because I, it, it's so difficult to, you know, I, my whole life was in the city of Chicago and um, you mentioned that violent break-in you had, and that's why you left South Africa. Um, one of the reasons that we left Chicago was the same thing. The crime is just out of control. And, you know, as soon as you become a parent, you stop, you know, I, do I want to raise my son in this kind of environment? But because I still work there, I have to be able to commute. So I, I moved an hour south. I'm in rural Indiana, 
And it's, it's just so different. I'm surrounded by farmers, so I can have access to things like you're saying, you know, I can develop these relationships. So, um, I'm, I'm, I'm definitely, you know, I'm moving my whole life because all the things we're talking about, they're so important to me. And that's one of the reasons I'm so grateful, um, that you came on. Are you, are you familiar with the two, with some of the presidential candidates running, um, next year for, in the U S? Um, Yes, I am. I don't. I don't know. Uh, I mean, I, I don't know too much about U.S. politics. But what has always uh, left me rather dismayed is the fact that you do only have uh, you have mm. so few, uh, and you have to choose red or blue, and yes. uh, and they so it's so polarizing. And it seems to me that the system itself uh, is dysfunctional, and we need to have many, many leaders. And servant leaders, the whole, you know, we need servant leaders, people who who serve uh, and yes. um, not, so, not enrich yes. themselves, right? But in terms of in terms of USA politics, I do think that I, I'm I'm excited to see that Robert Kennedy Jr. has stood up yes. and uh, and and is is standing because uh, he seems to really care. He seems to be a man of integrity. And it would be wonderful if that can be restored to, but generally speaking, I'm not a political animal and, and I ah. believe that we need, the whole system needs to change. Uh, well, Tess, I, I'm not um, super political either and I find it um, kind of depressing, but what, what makes me very optimistic about this election, and I don't think they're going to make it, but the fact they're even running is um, there's on the Republican side, there's Vivek Ramaswamy and I listened to a long, a two hour podcast with him and I've listened to a lot of JFK Jr. And they actually have, it's funny because Vivek is running on the Republican side and JFK is running on the Democrat side. They have so much crossover in what they're saying. It's really wonderful, Tess. It, it's very, um, it's very encouraging. And, uh, you know, both are, instead of talking about the negatives on the other side, they're talking about uniting the country, getting away from the corporate political alliance that puts, you know, big farm and the military above the people. And um, it was just, it was so refreshing to hear both of them talk. And then you look at JFK, you know, he looks in great shape. He's working out. He just looks like he takes care of himself. And you want those kind of people, um, you know, he, he obviously health is important to him. He's living it. And then Vivek is, I think he's turning 38. He's a young man. He made a lot of money. Um, he, I think he's a, a multimillionaire or a billionaire. He's got a young family and he's, his wife said to him, you know, you're very young. Why don't we think about running in 20 years? And he said, because I think 20 years might be too late. I'm worried about the future for my children. So sometimes it's, it's, um, the last few elections in the U S it seemed like the two choices we had weren't, weren't very good. And it got me as an immigrant depressed. Cause I'm like, this is the best. And I, I I'm very, there's so many things about America that I love. And it, it got me down that the last two elections we've had the best two candidates were kind of, they, they, they didn't seem they were a good representation of the country. And, um, so just having people like Vivek and JFK Jr. come out, it seems like there's often there's, there's, there's optimism. And like you said, kind of people, people's mindset are changing and, um, one thing with you, just me on the outside, look, listening to your story, I, I would think that a lot of people in your situation would be kind of bitter and angry. And you seem like you're, you, you're very positive and you seem like an optimistic person. Um, is that a struggle or is that your natural personality or how do you stay no, optimistic not... <laughs> in the face, in the face of this? Um... Look, you know, I come from a long line of unsmiling women. Uh, I've said I've said that a couple of times because um, things have been going so badly for so long, uh, and women have been intuitively aware of it, but haven't had a platform. And uh, so, as I, I said earlier, you know, there's I'm optimistic because I see the opportunity for great change, despite the very difficult circumstances in which uh, change is being birthed. Mm -hmm. uh, it feels like we're, you know, we're, we're going to be able to get back to what's really important, which is health, it's family, community, and, and, um, you know, love and courage and, and the power of the human spirit. So that's, um, you know, that's why I feel optimistic and I, and I, I try and share that, and because I know many people are very fearful at the moment. Because what do you do when, when uh, everything you know is suddenly um, all the people you've trusted and the systems you've trusted are actually they seem to be harming you and uh, and don't have your best interests at heart. So uh, I try and share that we actually have opportunity here to really create something better, and, and we need to set our goals 
high and imagine the sort of world we really want to live in and then set about creating it. So that's what I, I hope to share with others. That's beautiful. Do, do you think, um, do you have new, a new, um, almost like a new calling on life that you didn't have pre-2020? Like, do you feel like you're no. almost being pushed to action? Yeah, I, I always wanted to make a difference and help people. And it was, and I, and I was quite despondent uh, in, you know, sort of 2017, 2018, just thinking actually um, the system's dysfunctional. It can't be saved. There's nothing that can be done. People aren't interested in uh, we, we seem to have lost our imagination uh, and become very materialistic. Mm. And so now I do feel like this is a calling and it's not just my calling. I see many other people actually stepping up with a renewed sense of purpose. Mm. And, you know, if I could just say um, we we actually have some principles um that came out of the better way conference because you know that just we've called it the better way charter i'll just flash this up and you can always look at it on on the website um we held two conferences we held a conference in 2021 called um anyway the better way conference and we held a second one this year in in may and you can access those online the 2021 one it, um, sorry, 2022 is still, uh, it's all free. You can access all of those. And, and there's a lot of information there that would be useful if you are interested in learning more about the vaccines or the environment or integrative ways of health or what can be done about the corruption of science. Um, but this, uh, these, better way, this, these better way principles came out of that first um, conference. And it's, it's they're very simple. And it's this is how we all get along together because we've forgotten how we get along together and what's important. And um, number one is we act in honor and do no harm. Number two, we are free beings with free will. So we take responsibility and control of our health and our choices. We're part of nature. So we need, we need to be well and our planet needs to be well. Um, spirituality is integral to our well-being. We need a sense of purpose and uh, and. I promise you, it feels good <laughs> when you when you're on the right track. Um, we thrive together. We value different perspectives, so we don't need polarizing. This is right, and that's right. We need to be able to hold different points of view and, and use these different points of view to to improve our knowledge and wisdom. And uh, and then seven is we use technology with discernment. So we recognize that technology is important, but we need to use it with discernment because giving a mobile phone to a two year old. Uh, is like giving them crack cocaine or worse. So these are things that we need to um, we need to really look at, and and um, uh, we can we can talk about five G and all of that as well. But uh, but also lastly, we do not tolerate the violation of inalienable rights and freedoms. This is a right to freedom to speech, to move about bodily autonomy, uh, and others. And we do not tolerate profit, power, and influence coming before the well being of people and the planet. So I urge you to to do have a look at that um, and. Because I think what we see, even in in what one could call the, the freedom movement, because there are many, many groups that have their eyes set on new ways of doing things, but often they struggle to get along together because, you know, there's there's egos involved and so on, uh, or different different perspectives. And they think, well, we all have to believe the same thing in order to move forward. But through these principles, it's possible for everybody to um, to learn to cooperate together without um, always being right or without always, you know, always agreeing. And it's just a really simple way of of getting along. And um, and yeah, so I, I would be happy at some point to also speak a little bit about what we're doing at World Council for Health to counter this monopoly power grab that's going on with the World Health Organization and the globalists. So um, all those seven things you mentioned are very dear to my heart. We could talk about all of them. I'll definitely put links um, on the show. C can we talk before we talk about the the five G? Because I do want to ask you about that. Um, can you, can we can we talk about how you're trying to um, like you said? Um, Please. That that Please. was wonderful. So, so the World Council for Health is. We weren't intending to be an alternative to the World Health Organization, but we are. And the World Health Organization is a centralized structure. It's been completely corrupted with conflicts of interest. It's being run by corporate, uh, corporate cabal and, and influenced by China. The same with the UN. These institutional, old institutional, supranational structures are, have been corrupted and infiltrated, and they are not, they are not holding our best interests at heart. So we need alternatives. And what we need to do is we need to put the power back in the hands of the people of the health. Uh, you know, people need to be in control of their own health. But how do we do that? 
Well, we're decentralizing World Council for Health to different country councils. So every country will have their own council for health. We're not trying to set up another centralized structure. The time for these centralized structures is over. We actually have to decentralize. So countries need to be able to decide what's best for them. Uh, states need to be able to decide what's best for them. Communities need to be able to decide what's best for them and towns and so on. So that, uh, But basically, the individual is at the heart of this new system. Uh, each individual. So instead of having one institution that makes decisions for everybody regarding health, we have however many billions of people making their own decisions and sharing with others uh, what works, who to trust, and so on. Uh, and, and this is how we create new systems from the grassroots up. So we have we have already established a number of country councils. Uh, we have a Japanese Council for Health, a Malaysian Council for Health, South Africa, Ghana, um, an Ireland, Ireland Council for Health. So, uh, so we need 194 country councils uh, to to stand up to the World Health Organization and say, no, we are not going to allow you to dictate health policy around the world. Um, we also have prepared a policy brief for politicians. So I'll just show you this here, uh, rejecting monopoly power over global public health. You can download this from, the, from our website if you just search policy. And it outlines the big issues with the changes, um, the amendments to the international health regulations. So uh, this, is, this is a World Health Organization document that most people haven't uh, seen, even the politicians haven't really bothered to have a look. Um, this is a legally binding document that was drafted in two th 2005 that gave, that gave WHO an advisory capacity to make recommendations in the event of public health emergencies. Well, this, um, this, is, a, this is a compilation of the proposed amendments. So they've amended the international health regulations and um, and they it will be passed in May 2024 if we don't object. And uh, I'll just show you a, a random page. The whole thing looks like that. You see that bold, the bold yes. bits are um, are new new entries, and uh, and there's some stuff that's crossed out, like. Um, the regulations shall be implemented with full respect for the dignity, human rights, and fundamental freedoms of people. So <laughs> there's stuff that's been crossed out and there's stuff that's been put in. But the gist of it is, but and there's a lot that's been put in, but the gist of this is that this becomes legally binding and it gives WHO the authority to not only call an actual or potential emergency of, of any sort, but also to um, to to dictate what happens in, in such emergencies. So um, what, uh, what lockdowns, what businesses need closing, what uh, injections need to be taken, who, who needs to be quarantined, where they get, you know, what sort of facilities they get quarantined in uh, and, and vaccine passports and surveillance. So, um, so it, and, and it creates a, uh, basically a self-perpetuating emergency industry. Uh, and all sorts of things can be done in, in the context of emergency. And it also facilitates not only temporary recommendations, but standing recommendations. So it gives the WHO or whoever's controlling WHO the power to, uh, to dictate health uh, policy. And, um, but, but also we see, you know, through those, there's travel, there's also, it, it reaches into every aspect of our lives. So we really need people to, to get engaged on this issue because what it does is it sets up a dictatorial, totalitarian, centralized system controlled by supranational entities that um, affect our individual health, not only our health, but our sovereignty, our self-determination and self-governance. Wow. That's, um, I, I'm so... Um firmly behind your mission. And it reminds me, I come from a finance background and it reminds me exactly of the idea of decentralization. The um, the monetary system is incredibly corrupt. And one of the reasons that a lot of people are very excited about Bitcoin is it's it's a way to take back sovereignty of, of, of currency away from systems that um, just keep adding inflation and, and, and um, lowering the standard of living for most people. Um, so it's this idea that of of more decentralization is a lot not just in finance but with health i'm so, I'm so excited by 
And I think it's really great. It seems like it's it's in the air right now. Um, people are realizing that it just it doesn't make sense for one organization, like you said, to tell everyone how to have these blanket standard procedures, even if they weren't corrupt, because and obviously they are, but because we all have different needs, like you said, you know, the the, the mother, the child, the healthy adult, the the old person who's not healthy, we all have different needs and requirements. And and I'm so glad you mentioned that um with the with the vaccines, they were they were giving the these these experimental vaccines that have no long term studies, they were giving to the the people at the highest risk. Um, it's just it's everything seems backward. Um, so and I, I love what you said. Those seven tenants, the one you said that um, I've been thinking a lot about recently was use technology with discernment. And I work in real estate, and unfortunately, part of the job is you are either with clients seeing properties, or you're on the phone a lot, and you're you're on on working with the internet a lot. And um, I had a, one of my past guests, um, Dr. Ante Balduzzi. He's a longevity doctor and he's a very, very intelligent guy, very charismatic and charming. We were talking all about things like exercise and health and diet and uh, sunshine and and how um, the modern living in modern cities is just so um, against how we evolved as humans and how unhealthy it is. Um, and then he, when we finished talking, he actually, we were texting and he said, he sent me a, an hour long, um, presentation he made all about EMFs. And he recommended I read two books. One was called Dirty Electricity. The other is called The Invisible Rainbow. And they just, they talked about, um, and I don't really want to go off too much, but they talked about just how we are electrical beings. And I think in one of your um, posts that I was reading last night, you mentioned um, Nikola Tesla said, if you want to understand the secrets of the universe, um, think in terms of energy, frequency, and vibration. And you can just see in things like um, that when they first put a cell tower in, I think it was the Isle of Man off England, um, suddenly, you know, 80% of the bee population died. And obviously bees are very sensitive to vibrations. But I know myself, if I've had a day where I've been around my cell phone a lot, I don't feel great. And if I have a day where I put my cell phone aside and I go hiking or something, I feel so much better. So I know intuitively and instinctually. Um, and I'm so glad what you said about children, because one of my biggest fears is we, we seem to grow up in a world where I'll see my, my wife, who's an incredible mother, um, but I'll see she's just trying to send a text or something. And my, my son comes over and her, the phone is right by his head. And I'm like, baby, try and keep that away from his old brain. And just the, these things where it's so difficult when we live in a world of con connectivity and most people need a, a, quite a high amount of technology for their job. Um, trying to, number one, be healthy for ourselves. And number two, it's so scary because... This generation of children are the first generation that have been raised around these cell phones with these really, these really, really powerful, um, you know, emitting frequencies. So I'd love to talk a little bit about your thoughts on that and maybe some strategies we can do. The children are really sick. You know, if you look around, our children are very, very sick. They're overweight. They're pale. They're unhappy. They've got chronic diseases. I don't think we've ever there's ever been a generation of young people as ill as we ha we have today. So we really need to go back to basics and really like a diet of elimination. Say we're not sure whether this is doing it, but let's try doing without that. We're not sure whether this is doing it, but let's try doing without that. Children don't need technology. You know, we again we we're victims of propaganda because the yes. industry corporations are so powerful and they have so much money they can spend as much on marketing and buying off our media and you know putting their adverts uh and uh, a lot goes in they're not arbitrary their adverts are not arbitrary so they have a huge effect on on society and culture so we really need to wean ourselves off but but as far as children go there's no evidence to show that mobile phones and wi-fi is safe for them so as I just I just want to say that again, there's no evidence to show that mobile phones and Wi-Fi is safe for children. So as parents, why would we expose them? We expose them because we're told that it's very educational and if your child doesn't have XYZ, they'll get left behind or they should have a mobile phone because it's safe so you can call them when, you know, in case they need help or whatever. So and ultimately we all cave in because you know, their friends have got, and if the friends are doing it, we we outsource that decision-making, that intuitive sense that we don't want our children to, but others might know better. And so, you know, if other parents are doing it, then let's do it too. And 
and um, we we attribute uh, wiseness to people for strange reasons, not necessarily. You know, we we think people are superior. Often it's money. We think people with money are are very clever, um, and so. Um, you know, so we think, well, they must know right because they're doing something right. So in right in that way. So I'm very concerned, and there are many, many scientists and doctors around the world who are very concerned about the effect of EMF and Wi-Fi radiation on, on children, on everybody. Uh, and there's loads of evidence to show that it's not safe. But like uh, the vaccine industry, there's so much money to be made and power and influence over us who are ultimately the commodities. We are the product of this fourth industrial revolution. They want our data that um, we have, um, we, you know, we have, it's very hard to, to fight back at the moment. So we need to, we need to take back that, um, to, to take back our power over, over these, these things that we've, we've just sort of outsourced. Uh, I was saying the regulatory industry is very much like the vaccine industry. It's just been, it's it's basically an industry industry. You know, like in the, in the UK, the the MHRA is eighty six percent funded by big pharma, while the regulatory industry, like the um, what have you got there, the FCC or something, the but or, or, or even ICNIP, the International Commission for Ionizing Radiation Protection. You know, what a name! That's actually a private organisation with a lot of ties to the uh, communications industry. So you know, again, we need to we need to be less trusting of these corporations uh, and these regulatory agencies because they're self. It's like any of them, you know, it's like standing up saying we're going to regulate, but then they've actually got interests in the in the companies that are profiting from the the recommendations and, and profiting from you know from uh, 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 information that comes out saying well, there's no harm from wireless radiation. Um, and also, and, and just from a health point of view, if you're trying to think, well, why would something we can't even see, why would wave, you know, uh, frequencies affect us? Well, we are matter and energy. We, you know, just like Nikola Tesla, you know, if you want to know the secrets of the universe, think in terms of frequency, uh, energy, and vibration. Those are things you can't see and you can't measure. And so we think they don't exist, or it's convenient to think they don't exist. But uh, but they have a huge influence on us, and that's why you know. And, and we we we've been led to to think very much everything is biochemistry. It's you can fix things with pills and and that sort of thing. But we are we are chemistry and we are free and we are physics. And it's the physics side, the the frequency and vibration that we have ignored, and it and uh, we need to become interested in that again because that is where uh, EMF and radio frequency radiation. Uh, has uh, you know real health concerns, and uh, and not only is it is it a health concern, but it is it is surveillance. It's the means. Certainly, five G is the means by which the Internet of Bodies, which is us, by the way, uh, can be manifest. They cannot. Um, the, the the they the, the hierarchy exploiting us cannot manifest the um, they cannot ha have all our data if they don't have five G and six G and whatever because they just for the for their surveillance network uh, and also you know what we're learning is that frequency can be used as a weapon as well and so um, we again you know do we do we want to have these these um these technologies that can be used as weapons against us uh in our neighborhoods and so on so we really need to have a big um you know a big discussion and big conversations we really need to be talking about this and before rolling them out and permitting them in our neighborhoods we need to be saying no um, you know, we are not happy with this and we won't let you put up that mask because we haven't been consulted and uh, we need to discuss this. So there are big concerns with, with 5G especially, but but generally speaking, as you mentioned, you know, when they put up the first mast, um, the first mast, there were bird populations, bee populations. There's all these um, uh, uh, dolphins and things that get uh, uh, washed up from time to time. and um, and uh, there, you know, there are many people who are electro hypersensitive, yes. who actually cannot go into cities because they are so sensitive, and they are the uh, the human canaries in the gold mines and, and the 
in the coal mines. You know, they are the, the human canaries who, who are the first to, there's always going to be the first lot who are going to be the most sensitive. So yes. we'll all be sensitive uh, in due course, depending on the level of exposure. So, yeah, by 5G, I would say, is probably the biggest threat to our health and our sovereignty. Well, I'm so glad you said that. In the, I think it was the Invisible Rainbow, he talked about those people you were mentioning that you know some people just genetically are more um, susceptible to the. Um, to, they just they just feel awful, and they they basically have to be isolated, and live by themselves, away from everything because they just they, have, they can't function. Um, you know, in in towns and cities because of being being surrounded by that. So it's it's just so scary because it feels like the world is just moving towards that way and the solution i just i've got friends that tell me like the solution is you know just buy up land in montana and just get away from everybody but on the other hand we are social beings and a lot of us you know we need people for our jobs and it's a bit more complicated than that but um i'm so glad you mentioned that because these are all things that as, as a parent it's my duty to try and give my son the best upbringing and if, he, if to keep him as much as I can shielded from all this, what he's developing, because children are just so, um, so vulnerable in so many different ways. And yeah. it's Lawrence, I can't, you know, the, the, the humanity is in grave danger. We are a perishing civilization. Hmm. We have adopted practices that are killing us. And we have, uh, and we have corporations that profit from, from our disease. So, we we actually have to take control of our health, but the issue is so big that we can't do it on our own. There's no point going and finding your patch of land, and and because in order for this system to work that they are creating to control us, there will need to be towers wherever you are. There will be a grid. Mm -hmm. There already is, you know. So we need to push back. Not if we want to save our children. We actually have to. We actually have to work together with others, and and uh, and we have to push back together. The the the, the, the sort of the individual uh, mindset of um, I can, I'm okay, Jack, kind of thing, and yes. you know I'll sort my is not going to work now. It's not going to work. You're going to need other people to help you to make your place safe and make your environment safe. And this is what's really called upon now: is everybody working together to make the world a better place because humanity is in grave danger. Uh, I really, I appreciate your time so much because I couldn't agree more on all the things like those seven tenants you have that all, every single one of them is, is near and dear to my heart. Um, I'm so grateful. Before I let you go, Tess, can I ask you, because you're obviously um, very learned and you're wise and, and you've got a lot more experience than me. As a parent with three children, I would love if you could just end with something positive and optimistic, maybe a few parenting uh, lessons or wisdom or something maybe you can share with me. That would be wonderful. Okay. All right. Thank you. <laughs> That's a wonderful opportunity to um, to uh, to share something that's been on my mind. You know, over the last, uh, the last few years and decades, one's noticed that, you know, men have been really under the, under the cosh. They've really been, been hammered, you know, and, and, and almost made to be more effeminate, more sensitive. Their men need to get in touch with their feminine sides and all of this. Um, and, uh, you know, I see men, you know, uh, have, having the baby strapped to their chest and jiggling the baby around and so on and, and pushing the pram. And that's really, really helpful and lovely. But we actually need men to be men and women can do the feminine bit. So we need to be relieved as women from uh, trying to show that we can do everything and be as good as a man because we're not as good as men in certain respects. And uh, and uh, there, are, there are other things that we learn from our mothers and grandmothers that are absolutely essential to the well-being of our children, and we need to be able to retain those and share them. So, um, you know, and also we have lovely soft breasts and babies like snuggling up with mum's breasts because they've got soft breasts, and, you know. So we have attributes that, that help us to care and mother and nurture. And men have attributes that help them to, to take action. And so if I could just say, you know, if you're a father and you're, 
feeling depressed or whatever and anxious and you go to the doctor, maybe you've got a stressful job and they say, oh, you must take some antidepressants. No, that is a sign. That is a signal that you need to change something. If you're feeling angry and anxious, you need to change something. It's, you don't have to subdue your, your, your instinct and your intuition that something is wrong. And maybe it's your job. Maybe it's, you know, the, the meaning, whatever it is. Please get in touch with your, with your, your instinct. <laughs> and I'll just say again, humanity is in grave danger. We need you to 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 step up and really not. I don't mean step up in a in an aggressive way or whatever, but we need you to transmute your anger, your anxiety, your your um, dissatisfaction uh, into action for change to make the world a better place. There's nothing wrong with you if you're feeling these things. Please be our men and we can be the woman. We can do the, the feminine side and, uh, and we need to work together. Uh, there's, a lot of, um, there's a lot of talking men's heads at the moment. You know, like if you go on, you go on to YouTube or whatever, there's all these men and they've got all their reasons and they're critically thinking and doing all of that. We need to bring the heart in and the intuition. And, uh, and, and so we need to really engage women. We need to be asking, what do you think? What shall we do? You know, come and speak here. Come and speak here. And thank you so much for having me to speak uh, today with you and to share uh, on behalf of many women who don't have a voice and aren't able to share and probably could do it far more eloquently than me. But, um, you know, but so, you know, thanks very much. And so just to say, you know, it's really time that we as as um, not just across the political divide, but across the man-woman divide. If we, to do the best for our children, healthy children, we need healthy families and healthy communication between men and women and really respect each other's roles and, and innate uh, qualities. So there, I hope that's helpful. <laughs> that, that, was, that was really beautiful. And honestly, I, I'm so glad we connected and I, uh, I really want to somehow help your mission i don't know how I'll, I'll definitely reach out um but i'm going to put links to all your websites and i'm just i'm really grateful for angelo I, i'm not sure how well you know him he's one of my uh instagram friends and we, we talk a little bit and he said you have to talk to dr tess and i'm so glad he connected us um i consider it such an honor that you'll sit down and spend nearly two hours talking to me about all these things that are so near dear and near and dear to me and um i learned a lot from you and i'm, I'm really really grateful for you so thank you so much tess Thanks very much, Lawrence. If I could just say our new, uh, we have a new campaign called The Great Free Set. You've probably heard of The Great Reset, which is you will own nothing and yes. we will make you be happy with drugs and video games. Um, but The Great Free Set is our pushback on that. And it's a very joyful campaign. It's about really uh, extracting yourself from the the matrix, as you may have, you know, I think, I'm sure you've heard it called. Um, but, you know, um, to, uh, extracting yourself so that you start putting your efforts and your energy back into your community. You start doing more and more healthy things, taking back control of your health. And it's, it's going to be a ca campaign that every two weeks we just give a little, a little activity to do, be it, uh, you know, be in nature for an hour a day or something this week. And just little things that you can integrate either at a beginning, uh, beginner's level or an advanced level, how to detach from the digital dungeon and, and sort of little tips. Uh, that one can integrate, you know, don't support the beast by shopping at the supermarkets, you know, check your share portfolio so you're not, um, and don't, you know, whatever. So little, little activities so that we can all gradually stop uh, supporting these, the, this, the, the, these corporate beasts that are exploiting us and take our power back and at the same time get healthy and learn how to thrive with more connection. Absolutely love that. I'm so I'm I'm a kid of spirits. I'm I'm one of your biggest fans, and uh, really really appreciate you. Thank you very much, Lawrence.